You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, and author of a new book, Auction Ready, How to Buy Property Even Though You're Scared Shitless. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner and mortgage broker, and together we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website, as well as download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? Theelephantintheroom.com.au Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp and we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. I'm in the process of renovating my home. Well, it's actually pretty much a complete rebuild. And excluding the time it's taken to get the design right and approved and then find a builder and get all the documentation ready to commence works, the build is expected to take nine months. And I'm about three months in and rain has already added a week or so to the schedule. I can only imagine what it must be like to have a new house or extension built off-site and then craned into place on a single day, ready to be moved into within two months of that. I've watched it happen on Grand Designs a few times, actually, and I must say the idea does appeal. Prefabricated buildings have definitely come a long way from those demountable schoolrooms we're probably all familiar with. And today we're talking with someone who lives and breathes this stuff, and we're going to find out more about prefab homes that are more than tin sheds, ones that actually have a design aesthetic. Bill McCorkle is a fourth-generation builder, second-generation architect, and first-generation manufacturer. He's passionate about architecturally designed sustainable buildings and the intersection of architecture with prefabrication and new technologies. And in 2011, he founded Archie Blocks or Archie Blocks. Archie Blocks. Archie Blocks. It's not architecture, is it? No, it's Archie Blocks, a sustainable prefabricated building business. Bill and his team focus on sustainable urbanisation and in particular researching how to deliver more affordable and efficient housing to the Australian market. And this will be interesting to find out more about on the back of some of our recent episodes about the impact of population growth in our cities. We're keen to hear more. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Absolute pleasure and thank you for having me along. Thank you, Bill. Um, I mean, there's lots of, um, you know, people look at love property, right? And I um, look at your website because I think it's like property porn, right? Because (laughs) it's just amazing. You look at these houses that you've built and, um, yeah, I've looked at them for years and I just, you know, fascinated by the future of, you know, basically new buildings and how you can build it all off site. How does it actually happen though? Like how do you go from having a block of land to having a house on it? What's the kind of the build process, Give, I guess open up the tin a little bit for us. Yeah, okay. Well, there's no um, uh, there's no two ways about it. We're still architects and builders, so there's lots of the, the normal steps and processes that we need to go to through to achieve the end result being the house. Uh, I guess what we look, start looking at, though, is well, how do you combine the best of architecture, the best of sustainability, create mindful spaces that are then encapsulated within the end-built form? And so mm-hmm. how, how do you expedite that and how do you make it more as cost-effective as you can? Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's four walls and a roof. Mm-hmm. So there's only so many ways you can cut it up, but every site's different, every site reef's different, mm-hmm. constraints, budgets, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So first and foremost, it start, we start with the Lego pieces being the building blocks. Um, c- clients come to us for a, with a brief. We've got the Le- Lego box uh, p- pieces that have been put together or have been created already. We then put them aside, bring them back onto the paper, arrange them in a way that suits the budget and the brief mm-hmm. and the constraints of the site, and that's step A. And so coming up with the concept design. So it's like modular. Yeah, so we find that in our business, like the – Cost efficiencies come through not only the building side but also the design side. Mm. So if we can get the cost, the the jigsaw pieces put together succinctly and well, then you're taking down on your waste, you're taking down on the materials, the use, the cost and the labour to put them all together. Mm. So with that in mind, coming up with the Lego pieces, putting the brief together, then coming back with the budget and the brief, Again, being builders and architects, we've got a really unique capacity to go and show on a piece of paper this is what your house will look like. Yeah. 
and it also will cost this much as well. Mm, wow. And so I find that's quite unique. And the amount of times that we get disgruntled clients coming back up through the system because they've gone down a particular rabbit hole mm. with a particular architect or designer, mm. they've really invested emotionally a lot of time and effort into a particular product thereafter only to find out that it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent above their initial budget. Yeah. Mm. You know, so find, find, you know, from the whole concept of design and construct, you get realistic budgets. Mm. So brief, budget, design, sign off authorities. Now so, on the constraint side, because I think that's a good word, is there more constraints if you're going down a modular build way or is it easier versus kind of building, you know, a development, I guess? Like is it easier to kind of just go and you can plot, put your block of land or your building pretty yeah. much anywhere if you've got the right support versus a building you can't build anywhere, right? So is it easier to build with modular than kind of normal building techniques? With every form of building, there's always going to be a constraint. Well, constraint's a really vulgar word. So we'll say opportunities. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. It's so, a pivot. <laughs> yeah. So we create opportunities with the, 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 the design parameters that we are given through transport. Yeah. So throughout New South Wales, there's a particular transport width you can go to, which is different to Victoria. Ah, mm. right. So yeah, because you've got to put these things on the back of a truck, right, 100%. and get into the site. Mm. Okay. People then talk about we're moving lots of air, mm. a volume of air. Mm. Um, but there's pros and cons. Look, mm. there's pros and cons in everything that we look at, and it's how do you, you know how do you outweigh one over mm. the other? So our constraints typically come through the size, the height, and mm. the length. A typical module right. is 16 meters in length. Four metres in height, so you get about yeah. a three metre internal height into the right. in, internal space by about five to five and a half metres in width. Yeah. But we've done two-storey voids before, so mm. you've got modules sitting on top of modules. With the floor taken out. Yeah, and having six metre high voids, mm. you know, in living spaces. Mm. Um, we've created schools that have 16 metres clear spans. And so, and you've got end to end to end, so you've got up to 30 metres of internal space mm. clear. Mm. So you can manipulate the structure yeah. to create forms and volumes, yeah. whatever might fit the internal brief or the external brief that but is it, given to but us. But it's all got to be a multiple of the actual size modules that you've got. Correct. Right, yeah. Yeah, and then with each module there's costs not only yeah. involved in the transport but also in its installation at point of, point of placement. Yeah. And so in terms of price, if you just – kind of compared building a pretty nice looking house that's sustainable design versus going down the modular way, is it similar or is there a big gap? It's reasonably similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the biggest costs, of, one of the biggest efficiencies come through time. So I've got, a, interestingly enough, a house being built on the block adjoining my house in down here in Melbourne. The, uh, uh, the guy next door, they've only just put a roof on in the last two or three days and they've been with a stick frame being put up. They've been on site now for 10 weeks. We get to what's called lockup, which is windows, roof, mm. cladding in about 10 to 12 days. Mm. So <laughs> we always tell clients you have an opportunity of accelerating your life experience by yes. looking the modular route and because you can <laughs> then. Life experience. Yeah, we're moving chapters pretty quickly. Well, I think of mine, I could have kept my tenants in there a lot longer. While well, it was being built in the factory, I could have still been earning income. Correct. Until I demolished it. Yeah, <laughs> or not paying income whilst you're renting outside, yeah, yeah. offside. Yeah, 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 yes. So it's, look, we say our costs start around about three and a half to $4,000 a square metre. Um, our typical house is around four to four and a half thousand dollars a square oh. meter. That's complete. So that's architectural fees, structural everything. fees, everything. Yeah, I yeah. wonder about that because I was actually asked that question the other day because somebody asked me, what's your dollar per square meter? And I was like, well, 6,000. And then I went, hang on a minute, no, because I haven't added in. I hadn't added in all the, the uh, consultant's fees and I hadn't added, hadn't added in even art landscaping, you know what I mean? Yeah. It works out to be close to 7,000, so about yeah. 6,800 or something. But, yeah, yeah it's when, difference. Yeah, 100%. And, mm. like, when you do start adding all those if peripheral costs, Mm. And people sometimes get blinded by the square metre rate that you see on a building contract yeah. and go, it's, that is how much I'm spending. But in actual mm. fact, you know, when you spread it over multiple different. Plus the rent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to yeah. add in the total cost of it. Yeah. 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 Mm. But you could also be taking a smaller house to a, you know, that doesn't suit families to a house that suits two families with teenage kids, a family with teenage kids, mm. you know. Yeah. Well, and so your market's huge. Yeah. And that's the other thing you've touched on as well. Square metres, like each square metre costs money. Mm. Like you've got the flooring, the structure, the painting, the plasterboard, the lighting. Mm. And so really 
energy efficient, smart designed home, it doesn't need to be spread over many square metres. Mm. And so, you know, they always talk about the lost space in circulation. So if you can take well, well thought through, smart design, remove circulation and create really smart spaces, mm. you lose heaps of square meterage, mm. which, you know, obviously comes back to cost. Yeah. So do you think it's more attractive to people, though, that are a bit minimal mindset, more live small, or do you think that the people who do want those big houses will, will go down the modular route? Uh, I think there's a, probably a misconception that, you know, because it's modular, it is small. I think, um, you know, well thoughtful design, you can make it as big as you want. Mm. I think um, furniture placement, like actually designing smart from the get-go is yeah. important. Um, yeah, that's a good point actually because, you know, when you do get a, a, a sort of in the traditional way a house designed and, and generally you'll have the furniture plans in there to, to work out whether you can work in the room basically or whether the room works, do you do that same thing with the modular? 100%. Mm. Yeah, and you have to. And so mm. getting back to the earlier question is with, you know, your big mansions that are built, obviously there's there's a room and place for every type of house. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, you need to do that, like the energy efficiency, yeah. the smart yeah, design. Yeah. You know, I look at even just the basics of cleaning the house at the end of the day. Yeah. I know a lot of people that say, oh, I don't want an extra bathroom. It means I have to clean it. Now, I am curious, though, back to the, the truck width. So what's the width? Of, <laughs> how wide can you carry uh, you know, a, a building around in Victoria versus New South Wales. So Victoria, they say it's five and a half metres as, yeah. a, as a width yeah. and New mm. South Wales five. Right. But that's from outside Spigot, mm. Gas Point, Gutter yeah. to mm. outside Point. So Rivers there's hanging out. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm. So there's no wiggle room in that. Mm. And, you know, and, the, and the transport companies, rightly so, are mm. extraordinarily strict you know, on those widths. So that half a metre, does it make, I mean, you have to, does have, you have a New South Wales design and a Victorian design? Uh, we, we typically start off about 4.8 metres. Right. Just because it gives us wiggle room. Mm. Yeah. You know, we don't know what type of sunshine we're going to put on the outside or, you know, express volumes or. So the Victorians actually ultimately get half a metre shorter, ha- you know, houses. Bigger. Bigger. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, no, because you, if you've oh. got one size fits all, yeah. th- then they could have. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Was yeah. well, there any yeah. other states that are much yeah. smaller, like, like uh, three, three metres or anything like that? No, no, no. no. Okay. Well, we have looked to ex- explore the opportunities, opportunities of heading down to Tassie um, and then you're more constrained by the width that let, is let on the, um, the sea ferries. Because right. most people when they're building, they don't have to think about logistics in that quite that way. Mm. You know, you've got to think about where your materials get delivered and all the rest of it and how they get there. But, but if you had <laughs> opened up an office in, you know, or a building site in Tassie, you could build Actually, them there, couldn't you? 100%. Yeah. Yep. 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 And so yep. are they all built in Melbourne? Yes. Yeah. So if you want to build one in Sydney, because I know you've done a lot, you know, in somewhere like Avalon or, you know, et cetera, there's, you know, you just put them on a truck and drive them all up. It's just another 1,000 kilometres. And the actual transport itself is not overly expensive. So A to B, like, you know, the typical cost, there's these, they talk about these rules of thumb and there's always a rule of thumb in building and architecture. Mm. You know, a kitchen bench, 600 mil, your bench top with bench top, 1.2 metres, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So the same with the rule of thumb in the transport world. They say, you know, logistically it's costs around two and a half to $4,000 to actually transport your, your your module from Melbourne around Victoria and right. add another thousand dollars to get up to Sydney. So you're about right. at four or five thousand dollars for the actual transport. Yeah. Where the cost module. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. But where the cost come in is the crane, logistics yeah. around the power lines yeah. and traffic management. Mm. So you get really um you can get yeah. It's 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 all site specific. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that because when I was looking on your website and I thought, oh maybe I could have gone down that path. And then my streets around my place are really narrow. I've got, in fact, my builder said to me the other day, he said, you know, I looked at your site. I thought, great, you've got three street frontages, which I do. It's in inner Sydney. Um, but each of those streets is the width of a lane. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's been a nightmare yeah. trying to get trucks in with parts of But have you been able to do it on those streets? Um, we've, we've had all sorts of uh, um, creative solutions. Mm. Um, we had one time where we had a crane build another crane to lift over an eight-storey building to place it in because the street was too narrow. Wow. Um, but that was costly. That was extraordinary. Was that in Brunswick? Uh, that was in Collingwood. Right, because I noticed on your website there's one in Brunswick. That's what made me think, oh, you could right. actually, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, that was a um, uh, that was a bit of a story. Um, we had the um, all the approval from all the, the logistics and transport. Yeah. Two weeks out from installation, we get the phone call from the traffic company saying, I don't think we can actually lift the house in from that point. 
So we had to do a mad scramble. Right. Oh. You know, you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. Mm. Mad scramble. We went and um, found out who the dean, dean of this actual um, TAFE was or the faculty mm. head. He made a wager with me that we wouldn't be able to do what we needed to do. Like right. it was $10. So we used a front um, forecourt for the, 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 the TAFE, set a crane up there, set another crane up to set that crane wow. up and boomed an 80 metre length or 80 oh metre module God. in. Oh, yeah. It must have been stressful. Um, oh, we've had a few moments. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We had another, anyway, I could go on about this. This is a good television show. No, tell us lots of stories. Stories oh, are good. We had, a, we had one, we had one where, um, another transport company had 30 ton modules and they were five and a half meter high by five and a half by 18 meters and 30 tons each because of the mm. concrete floor we had in there. And over the 18 meters, you couldn't get more than 25 mil deflection over 18 meters. Oh. And the only way that these, these could be transported from Derriment out to the Dandenong train line was um, on a, on these things called vessel carriers. And the vessel carriers, I didn't know at the time, was bits of spaghetti. And you place these modules on the top of the spaghetti yep. so they can ride 150 mils off the road. But these bits of spaghetti have no structural stability. So we had this oh, oh ha oh. moment and had to go to a traffic engineer to design these cages that, that got built in Tasmania from a specialty bloke down there, brought back up to Melbourne, put over the top of each of these six modules so it gave it structural integrity to then taken out to a site. Wow. So there's whoa, yeah, and that was that was a little bit more intense and, so, and more expensive, no doubt as well. Yeah, that was, but look, that was a, a government project, and the government was quite amazing because right. logistically, you know, they realised these things had to occur. Mm. We had something in our contract that kind of covered us for that. So it was a, and it was a joint effort between us and the government and the our, our contractors. So wow. what are the government though in that situation? They've got interest <laughs> aligned, right? They're going to be looking yeah. after themselves. But you know, let's say you know Joe Bloggs wants to kind of get, you know, a modular happen. How easy is it to kind of get all the councils on board that I'm going to move this house? Is it a nightmare or do they try to stop it as much as they can? Uh, we had Northern Beaches in New South Wales was one of our first installs up there. Mm. Um, we had a, a, a meeting with, I think, eight, 18 people all representing different departments yes. for the, the council. Also, they could get um, a understanding of what it was to have a modular house mm. taken a one and a half kilometres through one of their roads. Mm. Uh, and so it was one of the first, you know, first of the kind up there. Yep. Um, similar in the city of Stonington down here in Melbourne, um, uh, we had to get the mayor in at the time, had to stand in to actually say, okay, no, they're allowed to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't remember exactly what he did, but we got an influence from an influence who went mm. and assisted yeah. because they had no concept of what it was like for a what modular are you doing? home. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so, you know, in answer to your earlier statement about modulars come a long way or off-site construction has come a long mm. way, people still have a misconception of it being mm. um, a, a donger or a mining camp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. A site shed. A site shed. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, you know, I guess they're not really that. I mean, so what, what some of the builds you're doing now that, like, you know, how, how, how accessible are they? Because, you know, I know that your price point, I mean, are probably a little bit higher. They're not really going down the affordability range, but or are you going in that direction or? Uh, look, we set the business up originally to create affordable architecture. So it's something that we're really, really passionate about. Uh, and it's how do you do that is through repetition. So um, with further repetition in the business, then we can cr create cost efficiencies. Um, anyone that comes into the business of Archie Blocks these days, I say there's three major things you need to think about. It's repetition, repetition, repetition. Mm -hmm. So repetition allows us to drive pricing down. Um, we, we do sit, well, I think from a cost per square metre, we are cost effective compared to a traditional architectural build, mm -hmm. but we're by no means pushing the limits for volume ho housing, mm -hmm. which are, you know, from memory's sake, you know, closer to $1,000 to $1,500 a square metre. Yeah. But we offer a very different product, extraordinarily yeah. different product. So it's kind of like the Tesla sort of story, right? You know, no one wanted to buy, you know, electric cars um, and so they built an amazing electric car and, and proved that it could be <laughs> faster and better than, you know, other cars and then yeah. people want, started to want them and then that made the business profitable and now they're starting to bring down their price of their cars and because they've been able to build that kind of scale. So do you think that at some point, though, we'll stop building at, you know, houses on site? You know, do you see that in the foreseeable future? Uh, well, I know there's certain countries around the world that uh, having off-site built homes are desirable as opposed to on-site. Uh, I don't think Australia has made that quantum leap as yet. 
I believe that will happen once you do create really cost-effective housing solutions for off-site construction. Um, a lot of our costs come through the need of the, the structure that we require to transport it from A to B. So, and it's also we still build with traditional building methods. So we've still got a carpenter that cost X amount of dollars a square metre, you know, skilled labour or skilled, as mm -hmm. opposed to a skilled labourer who might, so efficiencies and costs really only start to come down when you look at not only the material wasted, but the trade and the labours that go into it. Um, and will that happen? A hundred percent that will happen. Will you lose personalisation at that point? Not through repetition. Yeah, because you still like, you know, the, the famous saying from Henry Ford was I create 18, 18, 18, 18 colours of car and they all come in black. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I, that's kind of our mentality. Is like yeah, you can, yeah. It's still a desirable, like it's still a product. It's four walls and a roof. Mm. Um, but there's no reason why that product isn't achievable and accessible. If it's mindful, sustainable, you get all these benefits on top mm. of a roof over your head that's cost effective. So how do you do that? So you, you're modular because I know we, in sustainability, for argument's sake, yep. requires the building to really take into account the aspect, for argument's sake. So there's one example. Um, so with a modular building, how do you make sure that it is able to offer that flexibility around aspect in order to make yep. it more sustainable? So passive house is pretty important these days. Mm. Um, so creating a passive house is literally making sure there's no air leakage. Right, yeah. And so if you create a home that's got no air leakage, it kind of um, knocks on the head a little bit about orientation because mm. you're still going to use minimal um, uh, um, uh, internal environment like air, air con or whatnot to heat or cool a house. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, what we always start off with is, you know, creating a really sound seal to the house and that means there's no air leakage. Mm -hmm. there's no air leakage, then you can maintain the internal environment really easily. Yeah. Obviously, there's massive benefits from the north-facing sun. You know, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's massive benefit from closing out the south, yeah. the west, and letting a bit of the east. Mm -hmm. But that's just through natural design. Like any architect will look at a site and go, well, my, ax my view might be behind me, but that's my north, and that's where I'm going to benefit. So you, we always do start with orientation. Yeah. Um, but it's not such a factor when you don't have mass. And so because we don't have thermal mass like concrete or bricks, and they're the ones that store the energy. Mm. Right. And so that's where you get your most benefit out of solar orientation. Yeah. So we don't have those to store the heat. Then, you know, we look at other techniques, which is just well-sealed buildings. Right, mm. okay. And insulation, I presume? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, insulation, sealing. Yeah, like it's really interesting. I did a – we've completed just recently a house in, um, uh, in Malvern. Walking from the old house to the new house, and the old house had no um, underfloor insulation or any F FC sheet to lining the under, yeah. and you feel on your feet cold to the warmth of the new to the old. It's it's quite extraordinary. Wow. So the elephant in the room is 100% for you. The reason that Chris and I do this podcast is because we passionately believe that property buyers can do it better. We really want to help all of you understand all the risks, but also the ways in which you can avoid your elephant making the decisions. But well, what we would love for you to do is just to share this episode and share other episodes with people around you that are going through the property process. Give us a review on iTunes. A five star, please, would be very appreciated because because this is about making sure that we all benefit from the wonderful information that our guests have been sharing with us. So, Bill, you're not just doing whole houses, you know, instead of just knocking down the back of the house and getting a builder in to do an extension, a lot of what you do is actually the extension portion the by itself. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. how does it actually work? So you, you know, you're mainly doing the living areas or you're adding bedrooms or, you know, how you actually, what, what actually parts are you doing? So the most common one we do would be kitchen, living, dining, bathroom, laundry, and two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And so one on Keep top of the other. Front. Two bedrooms upstairs, all yeah. living downstairs. Yeah. yeah. And then like, again, if you look at access being, you know, cost prohibitive, uh, cost factor in a building, um, you, if you're if you're taking out the need for labourers and carpenters and electricians to lug their materials and tools from one end of the house through mm. to the other, mm. it kind of makes sense to be able to, in a day, lift them both out the back and then you're done. Bolt them together. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> fig figuratively done, but zip does, it? Z like a yeah, zipper? Yeah, yeah. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's your <laughs> trowel. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really like, you know, smart, well-designed, smart prefab is all about the time, the losing 
as much time as you can on site. Mm -hmm. So the quicker we're on and off, the better it is. We don't have, we got some disaster stories where we're on site for far too long, but mm. we've also got some amazing success stories. Yeah. So you've got to prepare the site, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, you still got to do all the groundwork and services and everything else that is required. So there's a period of time. I mean, how, how long would you normally allow for Two that? Two weeks. Right. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Because remember, all of our services are either underslung because mm. we've got four hundred mil off the, thereabouts off the ground. Oh, okay. Or they're running through the substructure. Right. So, and you've got little manifolds that come out the side, and you're literally just tapping in. So, is there any um, downsides to your product that you're still trying to work on? Like big weaknesses in the product where you think, you know, the traditional building has still got us in this space that we're trying to fix. Uh well, materials. Okay. Yeah. So I, I sort of mentioned it earlier, the uh, concrete. Mm. Yeah. We have done concrete before, but it's a costly thing because it's weight right. and weight adds cost to crane and transport. But where would you want the concrete? On the floor? On mainly? the floor. We yeah. just lay the slab and then use the structural slab. We have done that before. Mm. Like we've actually set it all in the formwork, but then it's more time on site. Right, and so yeah. you're sort of like trying to marry up. Mm. Um, we've used different products to give cemented style products, but it's still. Mm. Still not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. You know, mm. if it's not, if you, you know, it's that whole. WA saying if you go and hit the brick, if it's not brick, it's not brick. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you can, and you want, we, we want to be true to the materials we use. I mean, mm. I think sort of that that's pretty important from an architectural sense. So from a sustainability point of view, though, let's say, um, you know, you are thinking that way and a lot more people are thinking that way. How is it actually more sustainable than just going down a traditional builder? Yes, you know, there might be uh, efficiencies in, you know, the man hours, but yeah. what in terms of actually other things, what what is it? Um, we've got a really good rule of thumb we've brought recently into the business is bin wastage. So how many bins are exited at the facility each month? So we've gone from 15 to three. Right. So that's just us being a lot smarter in the way that efficiency. So from a sustainable point of view, wastage is a pretty big one. Mm. Um, you then go down to um, efficiencies in space. So yeah. one, one of the things we mentioned earlier was, you know, each square metre costs money, mm. but each square metre actually costs money to, to sustain heat. A heat and cool. Mm. Yeah. Um, well-designed, sustainable homes, you still can live with them for 85% of the year, but it's just mm. those 15% times of the year where it's, it is going to be too cold or too hot that you do need to, mm. you know, put Beast some environments on. Yeah. So you talk about passive housing. So that's basically where you, you like you said, it's an airtight house and they've yep. got vents or something that, I mean, how did they work again? We we interviewed Cecile Weldon some time back yeah. and she did touch Talk about this. Yeah. So explain that for us. So, so passive house is basically is keeping the no air leakage. Mm. Um, I touched on earlier this this project we did for the government. The there was a, it was a sub it was a station. It's not what a station. It was a um, uh, it was a signal control center, and within that you had to achieve a two hundred and fifty psi room rating. So that was literally when you think that a standard tire's got forty psi in it. Mm. They had to go and put a pressure hose in there and expand it to 250 psi. Wow. And that was a very oh no moment and it passed, thank goodness. I imagine nobody, like tick, tick, boom. So nobody, yeah, nobody yeah. wants to be inside the room at that time. No, no. No, no. But that, that just creates. Why do they want that though? Uh, so it, was, it had, had to do with an air suppression, a uh, fire suppression unit. Because that it literally was the control box for the whole Danny Long train line. Right. Yeah. And if that burnt, then they'd lose all that so infrastructure. from a safety point of view, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. do you do a lot in commercial space? Uh, we Last year we built eight schools okay. and the right. signal control, control centre the, the year before back. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, there's a there's With an initial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's that? With wood. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, cool yeah, yeah, yeah. And better features. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there was an in initiative that I believe the New South Wales has taken up as well. The, the Vic government did a couple of years ago where they had a big push towards called permanent modular um, mm. buildings. And it kind of makes sense. Like they are. Permanent modular. Yeah, it's just a bit of a play on words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's it's from the way we see it, it's like we still procure a building. Like it's still four walls and a roof. Um, it just happens that we built them off-site. So, so the point being it doesn't have to be temporary just because it was built off-site. No, but we have yet to occur. But I, I'm thinking of three clients who have come to us, no, four, one just happened last week, who have had the house for, or the building there for a period of time. They now want to go and pack it up, take Do it they? off and sell the land. Wow. wow. Yeah. Which I think is pretty cool, cool as well. Yeah. And what are they going to do with the house? Oh, they want to go and buy another piece of land and go and live there. 
Right, so it's like a house so, caravan. Sort yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't yeah. want to get a new one. No, they just want to go off and, you know, use the house they've got. They like the house. It likes them, obviously. Couldn't they just buy another house from you and sell it? Uh, and get something new? They could do, but it, it's like costs go up. So we we had um, ah, costs, really? you know, twelve <laughs> years, uh, eight years. Well, this particular client, the client, the first first one we're thinking of, we finished the house maybe six years ago, and so just costs have gone up. So he's an early adopter. He's and an he, early adopter. He's got the yes. benefit of actually. Um, is that though? <laughs> where is that cost going up though? Because I think it's interesting. Is it the materials? The materials and labour, and oh. the, and obviously they're the labour because wage costs. Mm. But, wage costs. Yep. But can you? Figure out ways to keep that material cheaper by buying more scale. Or we try and buy Australian quality, quality. So we've got a, had heaps of opportunities to buy offshore, um, but we've always, as a business, said, "Well, let's just buy Australian." Now, let's we'll probably change change in the future. I think mm-hmm. things need to with volume, um, especially if you want to go down that more yeah mass more cost. Market. Yeah, and that's when you start looking at you know you're purchasing all of your first materials like. Your own timber, your own glazing, window frames, yeah. joinery, mm. steel. Like you, you can get a lot of cost efficiencies in buying offshore, no mm. doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. And then I guess if then you're you own the companies that are making those things as well, yeah. you know, you can keep reducing the margins and you know, yeah. creating yeah. And cheaper products. And that's the whole thing about, you know, being in business in building. It's, it's, it's a race to the bottom, you know, so being the bottom, the, the most cost effective. Yeah. Yes. I remember years ago when I was doing, I ran an architectural business and we had a particular building company that was engaged to do a 75 apartment development for my client. Mm-hmm. And they were one of the very early adopters in going to procurement through the Chinese market. And they had a building, building contract of about $12 million and the next cheapest was $22 million. Wow! Did and they, they give it to the yeah, when they smashed it, like that was um, this business. So this was so this particular business. It was one of their first forays into the residential market, right. and this business now turns over. I saw last year they do a four or five hundred million dollars a year. Are they using lots of combustible cladding? Or? I reckon they probably have in their time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was inter- like it was interesting. Like you know, an early mm. adopter for them was going like, okay, well, how can we actually get really cost effective solutions? And yeah, yeah. Off to China and off to China. Factory. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, how do councils view mm. the modular building? Uh, early on, we would never say that we were modular builders. We just always spoke about us being architects. Yeah. Um, these days, uh, I mean, there's particular councils in in Melbourne, in particular, we might do at least five to ten projects a year in. Wow. So, do they like us? I don't think I think it's just part of the, the it's just part of the, the the natural building environment these days becoming more so. But you've got to win over the neighbours mainly, right? I yeah, mean, the, obviously yeah. the council will say yes or no, but the you know if the neighbours are kicking up, that's yep. probably more likely to get through. So, yep. is is that a lot of your challenge? Is helping the neighbours educate them? It's on? educating, yeah. I we, the neighbours would like it. Well, funnily, funnily yeah. enough, we went in once we they know it, what's coming. Well, they know yeah. that it's not going to be as noisy for as long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did a um, we did an in store a couple of weeks ago now, um, and seven years ago, six years ago, when we started doing installs in a urban Melbourne, you'd get truckloads of people would be there with signs. Be fascinated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but fascinated. Two, like, oh, no, it was fascinated. Yeah. Two, oh, right. two with weeks ago, iPhones. two weeks ago, I think there was three yeah, or four whatever. people from the office. Yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking, okay. I was thinking, it's really weird. Like Is you know, six years day? ago. Oh, it was a beautiful day. It was one of the first spring days. Maybe everyone was yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. They, um, you know, it's sort of lost the fascination mm. a, a little bit, particularly the inner urban areas where it is a bit more commonplace. So oh. who's your major competitors then? I guess if it's common, I, I just didn't think there was that many players uh, in this market. Look, there's there's uh, Archie Blocks. Um, we always Did say you? pre-built. Yes. yes. Um, pre-built. <laughs> who's um, who's in the same marketplace as us and Modscape. So, so really only three big players that are... There's a lot of other peripheral players that sort of bounce around. Mm. I think we're the only ones that really do the addition market. So okay. we, no. we, we've we got, and, and rightly or wrongly, that's a decision we made a little while ago. Mm. There's certain things we won't do in the addition market. Like we've, we, we're very adamant these days. It does happen occasionally that we won't do any work alterations to the existing dwelling because, again, right, yeah. time on site, I don't want to spend time on no. site. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. get us in and out. Fantastic, but they're not really competitors, really, because your your major competitors are probably going to be the big builders, right? The 
Oh, and, 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 and traditional builders. And traditional builders and architects. Yeah. Yeah. And look, we, you know, I think it, there's a there's a there's a place for each person in the marketplace. Mm. Um, I think, you know, the people that in the same area, industry area that we are, I think they all do great work. Mm. Um, I'm an architect by, by profession and mm. a builder by trade, but I've come up, I've run architectural businesses for six, eight years. Mm. So, you know, that's my first love. In terms of going outside of Australia, have you thought that, you know, is there anyone over the, over the, you know, around the world that have got a, you know, you're probably the only person doing this out around the world that you think these guys are really you know, killing it and, you know, are leading the way, like countries and types of country yeah. companies like you? Uh, well, um, yeah, Japan, there's some great examples of some businesses that do in excess of 22,000 prefab homes a year. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slightly more than we do. Slightly more, slightly yeah. more. Oh, uh, I, I actually saw one of the grand designs, the Kevin McLeod, the English version. Mm. It, it's a very old episode. And there was this couple that, that had a home built in a factory in Germany mm. and it was, much was made about the fact that the crew gets in the, the van from Germany and yeah. drives all the way across Europe and over to England and basically there's not one screw left over at the end that's so incredibly organised yeah. mm. that every single Bolts has been like named and labelled and, yeah, 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 except that, you know, without the um, the requirement for instructions quite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, with the, yeah, the, the Swedish instructions. Yeah, it was quite an amazing episode just to, to watch the whole idea of that yeah. planning, mm -hmm. not just in the design of the building but the full-on execution of everything right down to the last bolt. Yeah, so that's Hoff House is yes. the name of that business. Yeah, yeah. Um, and from the northern European states and countries, it kind of does make it a lot of sense in terms of the shutdown for the winter periods mm. um, in Scandinavia. Right, yeah, of course. You know, yeah. those northern yeah. European countries, 60%, 70% of homes are prefab, whereas in Australia it's under five. We're in much better weather, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. let's say um, I've got on your website, I love them, and I'm like, like, you know, can the builder idea, I just want this done, I want to, you know, <laughs> modular is the best for me. Are they having problems though when they go to the bank and actually getting the finance and... Is there are banks coming on board and because it makes great sense to the bank, you know, it's probably less risk, but they're probably still got a perception problem where they're not really understanding that, yep. you know, it's actually a good result for everyone. Yeah, so banks, which banks have that that the um uh, the cautionary tale of built off site not adding value to site. Mm, yeah. So although so they've a got a six hundred thousand dollar building contract that's been built out at Laverton, and the site sitting over in Armadale, there's yep. no tenure. No mm -hmm. connection. So that's the first, you know, leap of faith from the, the banking point of view. Is it a leap of faith? Probably not. I mm. mean, we're still covered by all of our insurances, all the state warranty insurances, all of our local building insurances. So they're not really at a risk. Your business has been going for quite a few years. You're not, you know, it's not your first job. Yeah. Yeah. Check yeah. your yeah. bank account. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we're six, I think we're eight years into the business now. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's from our point of view, they did become more cautious about three months, up to about three months ago, leading up to the last election. Um, but they seem to have rela relaxed a little bit again. Yeah. So it's it's funny. Like you can go to, you can go to the same bank, but speak to ten different people within that bank, and you get a different answer. Yeah. Okay. But is that because it's not commonly understood? Hundred percent. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So somebody gets it, will go. Oh right, I, I work this out. Let's put together a deal. And somebody yeah. doesn't get it. Go. Oh, too hard. Yeah. I just want the traditional way. Well, we've had instances before where a finance institution look at what we do and say, but it's just bolted onto site and I can come and unbolt it mm. and take it away when you're not there. Oh. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just like, you're kidding me. Um, Have you, haven't you ever seen house removalists taking down yeah. that old Edwardian, mm. ripping down the Hume Highway that's been taken from a queue? It's you know, there's stolen a house. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that'd be a first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, do you? So, okay, so I, on your site in particular, the, you could see that it lends itself to if someone's got a, a weekend or, or mm. you know, some nice bit of acreage or yep. something on an island somewhere, or maybe mm. not an island, you couldn't get it there, um, that, you know, you can you can plonk it effectively <laughs> almost anywhere on the site as long as you can mm. get services to it, et cetera, et cetera. But so what are the limitations? So if you have an urban site, yeah, you know, or... Or if the front of your house does need some renovating, I mean, obviously you said that that's not not business that you want to go for. But what are the limitations if you do you just want to put an addition on? Um, I think you've nailed it in your earlier conversation with your own house. Mm. It's the access to site. Mm. Uh, we had an example up at Pearl Beach on the yep. 
Central North Coast. Wales, Central Coast, yep. Um, amazing location itself was, you know, almost a suburb within Sydney. Mm. But, you know, unbeknownst to my design architect who made the first visit, five k's back up the road. It's a windy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 So we've had that happen twice. So Google Earth is your friend. You've got to sort of get well, in no, there and yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How far out do you start? Yeah. So we had another one where we well, were about true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 15 k's mm. from the site. Yeah. And those two trees happened to be on the road. And we actually oh, were wow. like 4.5 metres. Oh, yeah. my God. But it was the middle of the yeah. bush, so we just knocked on the farmer's door and said, do you mind if we just go through? Yeah. No, no, just <laughs> drive through your paddocks. <laughs> not, not cut the trees down. We just no drive, trees are being just cut down. Drive through your paddock. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, that so there's handy. always, yeah. I mean, well, I was at a site uh, last weekend down at Point Leo, and it's a, an amazing estate. But to get to the site that the clients want to look at mm. building on, you actually, literally, you'd have to probably take out 150 um, metres of 40-year-old trees mm. to get the access there. And I'm like, So it's not That's as simple not as. So yeah. you might have this <laughs> land. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You never think that sort yeah, of stuff, but, do you? Yeah, but, you know, we mm. speak to the property manager and go, okay, well, th- that's one access. Surely you bring hay onto the property. Yes, yeah. we do. Mm. What's the access? Oh, that's off this McClips Road down here. It's right. like, well. Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just about, you know, you got to ask the right question. Yeah. So what about these, you know, there's all this, you can go online and you can say, I can buy 50 acres, right? And then you look at the zoning of that 50 acres and you realise you can't build on it, right? Yes. Because it's um, environmental. Uh, you can only have one dwelling on it. Um, that dwelling is what's already on there. So mm-hmm. you've got to knock that down. Yeah. Um, but you've got all these 50 acres and you think, well, I'd love to have a little demountable house in the yeah. bush or et cetera. Yeah. Is, it, um, is there ways that your product, though, does skip past the rules potentially because it's not fixed there forever and it's not it's into shed. the ground. Yep. <laughs> Does it go um, in as a shed? Yep, yep. Um, so we look, like on that situation, you've got the two, you got a property and you want to set, put a second house on there. They always talk about each council is slightly different, but they talk about four water points. So first being a laundry trough, a water pan, a kitchen sink and a shower. Mm. So if you ha- have three of those four, then it's a non-habitable space, i.e. it's not fit for continue habitation. Right. Got you. So that's the first thing that we'd look at. And we've done that on numerous occasions where we go to the client and we say, look, as part of the building permit, we need to decommission your kitchen in right. the old house. Oh, cool. I'm, I'm, we're never going to use that anyway. Right. Or we just don't put or laundry, laundry in. Or you don't put the laundry it's in. Easy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when we're doing, um, you know, the, the proverbial granny flat um, and you've got that, that the issue with the Duloc, mm. then you always do say, look, let's not, not put the laundry trough in and uh, you can or get away that way. Shower out the back or something. Well, no, no, it's all bath, but functioning bathroom. Just don't put a laundry trough in there. Yeah, you can have a shower. Or try, or put the shower at the back or a bath. Yeah, yeah. 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 We well, always try the bath, and recently we got picked up by the building fair, and you know, putting two and two together, a bath can hold four hundred and fifty mils of more of water, mm. and so it becomes a swimming pool, and so you need to enclose it with a, you know, one point five meter high fence. Oh, no. Yeah. An outside one, you mean? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. No, I think just ditch the laundry. They yeah. can go yeah. to the local laundromat. Are there yeah. local laundromats out there? Um, but there are other ways. Like we're doing a job at the moment at Maringo, Maringo Park, which is about two hours northeast, northwest of Canberra, um, and we are going th- through a particular DA loophole, not a loophole, um, a DA compliance yeah. about the pre uh, prefabrication. And so the there is a bit of a you know if you type in tiny house um, into Google you know it's obviously a phenomenon around the world where you know people are fascinated by the ability to live small, yep. minimal etc. Uh, and a lot of these tiny houses they're putting them on trailers with wheels, um, and then it's like a caravan, mm. and you know it's got self-contained yep. uh, you know water yep. you can fill it up and things like that. Is that a way that people can use your type of product potentially? Do you think you'll ever go in that direction where you can basically take your Archi block anywhere just with a trailer? Yep. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. How is it different from a caravan? Oh, I was gonna, yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, we, well, um, they don't look like a caravan, right? Yeah. So they, they look beautiful little house, but it's on wheels. Yeah, yeah. But the wheels are really just pointless because the wheels are just there to pretend that it's movable, but it sits there forever. Yep, yep. Um, we have... I mean, look, being 16 metres by 5 metres by 4 metres, then it's a more substantial trailer home. Yes. Um, uh, We have had clients previously uh, who have have had the opportunities of looking and and relocating further down the track. 
we, you know, the tiny house movement, I think it's an amazing movement. You know, it came about after the hurricane in yeah. Katrina yeah. back in the States and that's where the movement really got a lot of traction from. Mm. Um, but, you know, we always say that you've got to still live in the house and having, you know, a tiny home, I think there's a lot of rom- uh, romantic notions with it, yeah. but you've still got to create a, a usable space that, you know, it's in cold environments or hot environments, you, it needs to be us- usable. Mm. So we say, look, there's elements of all tiny home that you take onto a house from space efficiency, um, put that into an box house on a bigger trailer, and yes, you can yeah. move it around. So, but it's interesting though, you, what you're saying is a lot of the principles of that in terms of design well, use space well, you can do that in your design, but you don't, it's not, it's, you feel like it's got to be much bigger and you're not going to have enough space, you know? Yeah. Like we, I mean, one of the things that we drive in the business is uh, mindfulness. And so you've got to create a space that you can be mindful in and a mm-hmm. mindful space is not something where you just, you're living on top of each other. Mm-hmm. But again, there's lots of good um, reasons for tiny homes. Um, I just don't feel that it's a reason to live small. I think you build small, but you need to design big. I think, yeah, and there's one extreme, too much space and just a hundred media rooms yeah. and all that sort of silliness um, versus <laughs> I think, you know, tiny houses are so clever. It's a bit like designing a boat to live on mm. or a plane. Mm. You know, I mean, they're small spaces and it's really clever and creative in terms of what you can do, but it's almost like a project rather than a real way to live, don't you reckon? I mean, yeah, and I mean, I think there's, it's interesting looking at Ikea, for example, they're doing, you know, robotics, you know, because they've got, you know, lots of customers all over the world. Some mm. are living in like a 30 square metre two-bedroom unit with bathroom, you know, et cetera, and they've got to say, well, I need to put a bed in here, so let's make that robotic and things like that. And have you kind of looked at those type of ways of, yes, it is only a container, but it can move into a, a studio, into a bedroom, into a lounge room, have you considered looking at those things? Yeah, we have. We've done a couple of concepts for various people on on um, uh, manip- manipulation of space, you know, and how you can move a wall and then you go from a dining room to a kitchen to a living space, yeah. or whatever and the use might be. And beds that come out of your drawers yeah. underneath the suspended. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some but interesting stuff. Awesome. Fascinating. Mm. Yeah. So I think there's lots of things you can, with everything, like you can sort of pick, handpick the best of everything and mm. you can put it into one space and it's an amazing uh, concept. Same with tiny house, you can hand pick, you know, great ideas from that and, mm. and, and place them into your own home. So what's the main reason somebody pick up the phone or come to you? Uh, so we find, A, they like our style, you know, so it's, I think that's a the foremost. There's to it, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's one thing I'm really proud of as a business owner is that we actually have created a brand through our style. Mm. Yeah. And I had a really, I had, so the, the, the guy who, who came up with the name of Archie Blocks, he was selling a house down the coast and he had a piece of land next to the house and the agent said to him, this house you've got here, that's amazing, but the house next door, it's something you could do an archie blocks on. And he's like, that's my name. <laughs> so for oh, me, right. it was like, like really cool. Yeah, so it was really cool that it became you know, a brand. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah. so we, people come to us because of that. Mm. Um, we also, we also, you know, myself and my wife, Christine, who we work collaboratively, collaboratively in the business together, we always do strive for sustainability and mindful living. Um, and I think that's sort of taken up with mm. a lot of our clients have that um, notion as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're mad in a way not to take up semblance of, again, mm-hmm. different bits and pieces. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing you a whole lot of money and or a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Bill, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. Uh, property dumbo would be don't be an architect and try and buy a house because invariably <laughs> you'll design it before you even turn up on auction day right. oh. and you'll leave disappointed. Oh. <laughs> or you pay too much, I would or imagine. Or you pay too yeah, much, yeah. yes. So what happened there, do you tell? Yes. Yeah, oh, so I've done it, it countless like times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done mm. it countless times um, where, you know, you get excited about searching for properties and you find the ideal house and then you spend hours and hours and hours of creating what that's going to look like. <laughs> before you own it. <laughs> before you even go and see it. Oh, my <laughs> and then God. you go and see it. 
Wow. Well, I think even if you're an ar- not even an architect, you, you do that, right? Like right, you still yeah, get the ideas of what could happen. I could add this room there and, yeah, and yeah, you've got yeah. no idea. what You've got less idea. At least you've got idea that what you can and can't do most yes. of the time. Yep. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I kind of know how much <laughs> it's going to cost to build it too. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, how yeah, about yeah. what it's going to cost to buy it? It yeah, sounds like yeah, you yeah. didn't get that bit right. No, no, <laughs> right. no. Did but you end up overpaying a bit? Uh, the current house we do have, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Did you fall in love with it before you bought it? My wife did. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah, and then I overdesigned it. Okay. <laughs> so you're so, so committed it was, to it. It was, it was the double whammy. <laughs> I overdesigned it, <laughs> overcosted it. Yeah. Did you use an Archibox? Yes. Yes, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, of course we did. Yeah. But your yeah. neighbour's not, obviously. Um, no, 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 no. I did suggest it. Mm, of course you did. I would have when, too if I were you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's just like, it's funny though, isn't it? Like they, um, they often say don't do work for friends or for relatives. And I always find, well, if you can't do a good job for a relative or friend, then who can who, who can you do a good job for? I'd be so upset if a relative or friend actually went to someone else. Mm. I know I've got their best interests at heart. You know, I imagine you'd be the same. Yeah. Yeah. And so is there any kind of points where, um, you know, what's the common misconception, obviously, you know, that people might have where they, you know, what's your roadblock? Like it's not price because it's similar price. Maybe it's a bit more logistics and things like that. But where does the person where you think they're going to sign up and they don't sign up, what's what's the big education problem that they've potentially got? I think with any design process, it's communication. Yeah. So if you can't communicate during the design stages on both what the aesthetic's going to feel and look like as well as the budget and price, then and clients get led. So sorry, so I say again, clients lead the conversation. So I find mm. from our point of view, if we don't communicate what the constraints or the opportunities are, if they're not priced ah, correctly okay. and yes. the client starts to lead the conversation, then the budget and brief often spirals out of control yeah. really quickly. Mm. So therefore that's where we find the biggest um, uh, fall off rate is, mm. is just when clients start to lead the conversation and you do need to listen to clients. Mm. I always say it's one of those things you listen to, you, you suggest something. If a client suggests something else back twice, then you work with that. So it's more a case of, you know, them not understanding what it costs to add all these features. And yeah. then all of a sudden they get a price and it's 1.2 million. You're like, and then they're like, well, actually, I don't want to, what do I lose? What do I cut back? Yeah, yeah. And then it's a process of saying, well, I don't want it because I can't get what I want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. what, what mm. we do these days is, you know, here's your design, here's the budget, here's the brief, tick, 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 all matches. I'd like to, you know, put an upgrade of you know, kitchen appliances and bits and pieces. Yep, we can do that. Mm. Let's sign the variation form. Here's your new contract. Here's your new price estimate. This is how we move forward. Great. You know, so that there, we lead that conversation. At least it's something called like fixed price builds, right? Because I think it's a bit of a problem that people are doing renovations is there's a, you know, two different contracts, right? One's a contract plus, you know, it could potentially be mm. change over time. Yeah. And then one's more of a fixed price contract with a builder. And can you explain how people can sometimes get themselves into problems with that? Uh, so one thing we often do is a provisional sum. Mm-hmm. So it's where yeah. you put an estimate into the contract is to do with site services, so site services being running up the gas or the plumbing and the sewer or the water or the electricity, um, that's often a provisional sum for us. Mm. So that's where, you know, if you've got to upgrade, uh, an example is I went to a client only la, two weeks ago. We had an allowance even before we went to site for the, the stormwater. Mm. I go to site, there's an old downpipe that comes off the back, it goes through a retaining wall, through a raised garden bed and then it just spills into an open drain. Now that's not going to be compliant to code. No, and so I know no. for a fact it's going to cost the client another $15,000 right. to upgrade. Mm. But that wasn't in the provision. No. Yeah. No, so services are... But so that's, it, that's common that you've got that. But I mean, in terms of the more build side, like is it, you know, because I think a lot of builders do a provision of it's going to cost somewhere 400, but it could be up to 500. Yep. And some will use like a, it's 450. Yep. Because uh, yours must be just... But a, provisions aren't usually that large. Oh, so provision for the overall house? Yeah, yeah. like instead of it, the contract, you know, you're starting to get billed and then it's like, oh, actually, no, it's a bit more expensive. Actually, no, it's a bit more expensive. And as you're building, it's getting more expensive. But yep. you can negotiate kind of like a fixed price. Yes, 100%. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So cost plus over fixed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I would never recommend doing a cost plus. Yeah. 
No, and I wouldn't do that with me either or anyone. Mm. And the only mm. reason being is like in, people need to have control and caps. Yeah. Mm. And from my point of view, it just adds a lot more time and effort, mm. you know, from the building point of view because you want to be fair and reasonable. Um, but if you don't have the capacity to keep other people down the chain, fair and reasonable, then it just it can open up cans of worms. It blows out. Mm. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. Nightmare. Yeah. And so let's say I wanted to experience the home before I sign the lot, dotted line. How do you give me, you know, do you have a display suite or how do you give me that? This is what it's going to feel like because that's one of the benefits, right? There must because, be someone yeah. Airbnb, surely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've actually stayed in one of yours in Airbnb. I didn't actually oh, know until I was to this morning. I um, I stayed the one in Cremorne. You've got that. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a house and it's a three level with a rooftop terrace. Yep. No, you don't remember it? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought you remember every single one. Oh, I, had a, I had an embarrassing situation recently where a client came up and said, oh, Bill, how are you going? I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't picture him. Oh, no. And then he told me who he was. I'm like, customer. nah. That's so bad. That's so bad. <laughs> I wasn't like that. I worked out who he was and I could give him his, you know. That, yeah. That. But, oh, look, I've had that. You know, I can't remember your name, but I can remember the house you bought, the house you sold, the whole story around the move, but I can't remember your name. So how do you do that? Do you have you got, like, go to the houses or you got display suites or oh, you got we, things to yeah. really give us that, ex- oh, like, VR? Have you got, like, I don't know, how do you? Yeah, how so do we have do? tried VR. Um, that hasn't been very, that was never very successful. And that was ripped <laughs> out and t- taken back to the kids' bedroom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, so displays, we have had displays. We do open houses. And if a client's yeah, really okay. red hot, um, we go through the facility with them and just yeah. walk through, mm-hmm. like, in C3, four or five homes. Right, okay. Yep. Wow. It must be quite amazing just in a factory seeing people's houses being built. Like, oh, it's, look, it's it's cool being at the facility and mm. just being aware and you can see, you know, the progression, how quickly it goes from start to finish. Mm. Um, but we do get held up by the usual things, joinery, you know, is often a big lead time item. Mm. But that's, you know, you've got your floor, if it's a solid timber floor, you've got your floor polishing and your waterproofing, there's a couple of mm. weeks in both of those. But mm. apart from that, things can be pretty pretty seamless. And have you seen a lot of these uh, robotic sort of builders and, and things like that, you know, because I guess, you know, traditional, meth- while you're creating a new way of building homes, traditional builders are also thinking how can we do it more efficiently, right? Yeah. And there's new technology coming out that, for example, can lay bricks for them yeah. and things like that. Have you seen those sort of things and do you think they'll actually, you'll, they'll be able to catch up with kind of making it much quicker? No, but yes, I have seen them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I think there's always opportunities out there to be creative and cut and, and cut, cut costs down in labour. Mm. Um, but you know, if if we've got the opportunity of placing a house in a facility that you can literally drive up next to and walk around, mm-hmm. it's a very different game than but no having, rainy days too. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So it's a very different game than having something that's been built on site. That's mm. you know, you might have to park X amount of metres away. Yeah to get to site and traffic yeah. and parking inspectors mm-hmm. and loading and unloading, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, rainy days still affect you, though, because you've probably booked in everyone to, you know, the council, the truck, the thing to all happen on March 22, and then, you know, big storm comes in. One, only once. All oh, right. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so we've only once had to call off a lift, and that happened down at Point Longsdale uh, in May of this year. Okay. Just delayed it a few days. Ah, uh, we put it back. Yeah, we left it, left it on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> oh, luckily, no one was living in it when you got back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like you know, we immediately got on the phone and you know rang the Surf Coast Sh- Shire Council and said, "This is what we're going to do," and they said, "That's fine." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> rang my insurer and said, I'm sure "This is what we're doing." They're worried they said, that's about fine. Yeah, you know, you're much at home. <laughs> Yeah. Classic. No, that's amazing. Thank you very much for the chat. Well, it's been a bit of an interesting tour around a different type of building and thank you very much for that. It's going to be interesting to see whether it takes off, you know, more and more, I guess, over time. So I guess we'll watch this space and thanks for sharing that. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We want to make you a better elephant rider and this week's elephant rider training is... Let's talk about just some of the things that we do need to consider if we are going to renovate a property. And obviously I'm in the thick of it, so this is all very fresh for me. Um, the we, You did talk about sort of contracts, cost plus versus fixed price, and I guess we could sort of explain a little bit more what, about what that is. And certainly the fixed price contract, um, I could talk about the way I've approached it, put it that way. So 
I made sure that when I, I got my plans designed by an architect and obviously approved through council, but then I actually sat down with the architect and interior designer and chose all the finishes and got all the sort of the lighting plans and electrical plans and all the extra bits and pieces done, all the detailing, all the drawings of the um, joinery, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the, all the bits that actually make the interior of the house effectively, right? And also the choices in terms of outside finishes as well, paints and colour bond and windows and, and all that sort of thing. So that meant that because I had all of that detailing done to, to a high degree of um, detail or accuracy, then when we actually put it out to tender, that's a very complete set of documents that the builder can actually quote to with confidence. And so even those provisional sums that you talked about, for instance, so there's certain things that the lighting is a provisional sum, So, but it's an educated guess as to what is reasonable to spend on lighting given the exact amount of lights that I'm going to have. Um, so the reason it's provisional and not fixed is because I still have to choose the, you know, the pendant lights or the actual track lighting in certain parts of the area, uh, of the living area. So because I'm reserving the right to make those choices, um, that has to be provisional rather than fixed. The thing is what often costs money is when that level of detail hasn't been done. So there's a whole bunch of surprises along the way. And also the other thing that costs a lot of money are variations, and that is where you change your mind. So the design has to have been really well thought out, really well thought out and committed to. And I have a friend of mine who's, who's very, very good in the design space, and I sort of as a bit of a mistake actually showed her my plans well and truly after they were approved and we'd gone through this whole process. And then she sort of came up with these nice ideas, and they were very nice ideas, but by that point, I realised that I was. It would have cost me tens of thousands of dollars probably to change. At that point, so <laughs> what maybe. What were you thinking? Well, exactly. What was I thinking? <laughs> Build the thing, then show the clever friends. So in reality, um, if I wanted her input, I should have showed her before it was all bolted oh, down, right. so to speak. Um, <laughs> Because obviously all of those changes require, you know, they require a change of drawings and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, and sort of the domino effect. So I guess that's the thing that this boot camp is really about. That's the way to try to minimise. So, you know, there's a couple of little blowouts that I have that were unanticipated, um, but they are very contained. And as a percentage of the whole bill cost, they might end up being um, not even 2% of their total bill cost by the time it's all done. And they were unavoidable in terms of um, site works, stuff that we discover once the actual work started. So it's hard to plan for that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but in terms of everything else, it's going, <laughs> I'm not deviating, and that is the way I'm keeping it under control cost-wise. There's another little learning there as well. If you Before you make a big decision in life, is make sure you go to all the sources of expert information in your life yes. before you make that decision because when you make that decision, the last thing you want to do is go and ask for their advice because you can't change it. <laughs> so. No, and taking that advice would have cost me a lot of money and I just, yeah. yeah. And then I've got to um, backpedal as well and not insult her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. So uh, be careful who you ask for advice for at the right time. When, so, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, very true. Join us for our next episode because it's a very special one indeed. Drum roll. Number 100. Can you believe we have got to 100 episodes? So in this episode, Chris and I are going to be running through our personal highlights of the first 99 episodes. Please join us. It's a great summary episode in terms of covering off a whole bunch of the things that we've been talking about. So if you've just started listening to the podcast, well, we encourage you to go right back to the beginning, particularly episode one, because it is really the foundational episode for everything we talk about. But next episode will be your shortcut. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Until next week, don't be a dumbo.
Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.